Chester Dick is the Commissioner, Steve House is the Deputy Commissioner, and then there's myself and three colleagues as Assistant Commissioners. Um, I am responsible for something called Frontline Policing, so that is essentially all the local borough policing across London and some of the specialist crime teams that deal with things like organised crime, gangs and homicide murder investigation. So that's me. The other three assistant commissioners, if you're interested, one of them looks after counter-terrorism, one of them looks after sort of other types of operations, things like demonstrations, public order, uh, and one of them looks after what we call professionalism, which is our sort of learning, development, training, that sort of thing. So that's me. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Um, you are part of the Met Police Management Board. What is this board responsible for? So it's like the board of any um, company, any big organisation. We're responsible for setting the strategy for the, for the whole of the Met. Um, so the Met's an organisation of about 40,000 people altogether, about 30,000 police officers, 10,000 um, non-warranted officers, we call them, police, police staff. Um, and the board sets the, sets the strategy and direction for the organisation. So we do things like set the budget, decide on the priorities, some of them with the mayor's office, who we're accountable to. Um, big things that happen, whether it's Extinction Rebellion, for example, whether it's knife crime, you know, some of the major priorities for the Met will spend obviously a lot more time looking at some of the operational response to those. But that's, that's broadly it. So I mentioned the four assistant commissioners responsible for different parts of the operational activity of the Met. You then have the Director of Finance, um, the Director of Corporate Services, which is things like HR and so on, uh, and a Chief Information Officer who looks after our technology on the board. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. What are your greatest challenges at work? Mm. Um, so, there's different types of challenge for us, really, I suppose. If I talk about what are the operational challenges, I, you know, the service, the, the kind of operational stuff out there, undoubtedly, you, you touched on it earlier, Patrick, the, undoubtedly the biggest one is knife crime, particularly amongst young people. That's just, the absolutely dominates, you know, the priority for a lot of our thinking. Mm -hmm. Obviously, other things come along, you get something like Ex Extinction Rebellion, that takes a lot of time and effort. <coughs> on an ongoing basis, the, um, the whole question of violence across London, particularly as it affects young people, whether it's about gangs, whether it's about connected with drugs, whether it's about robbery, um, all those things, that's undoubtedly the top, the top priority for us. There are other things that are not so operational that are really important for us. So we've had over the last few years, we've had a reduction in numbers of police officers. So a big part, a big priority has been, well, how do we cope with that? What do we prioritise? What services do we reduce? What do we focus on? So there's the organisational things like that as well. But knife, knife crime, violence, undoubtedly number one um, preoccupation for all of us. Who has inspired you the most at your work? So there's, um, gosh, so an um, event upstairs where um, there was a really inspirational person that says, not this only today, it's afternoon. This was a, um, a woman who was the victim of uh, a rape, a multiple rape actually, um, uh, last year. And um, she wanted to come here and say thank you to some of the officers who been involved in the investigation and, and caught and convicted the two people responsible for it. Um, but she was um, she was inspirational because of the personal courage she'd shown in terms of a really horrendous um, circumstance, really horrendous um, um, matter. The um, the fact that even with all that experience, she wanted to take the time to say thank you to the not just the police officers, there were some other members of the public who helped and things like that. Uh, and the things she said just made me come out feeling, do you know what? I want to go out tomorrow and do even better, do even more, and work even harder. And that's someone I've only just kind of, kind of met just a couple of hours ago. But really, I suppose, throughout my kind of career, it's that sort of thing that makes you think, this is what, gets, this is what you know, makes it worth getting out of bed. Mm -hmm. This is what's the impact you can have, I can have, police officers can have on people's lives if we do our job properly, if we do it well. And I think that's probably, so, you know, there's one person, that's someone I've only just met. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's kind of the thing, you know, I've worked with great police officers, people that have been great colleagues, highly skilled, experienced, all those things. But what it's really about is what's the difference for me, and I, I do believe for most police officers, it's what's the difference you can make for, for people in difficult circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we'd like to ask you, why did you join to the Met Police? Why did I join the Met Police? Well, 
So I've been in the Met. First of all, I've been in the Met Police for 37 years now, wow. um, which is um, which, yeah, it's quite a long time. So I went to university, and I didn't know what I wanted to do as a job when I went to, to university. I studied history, so nothing as useful as business or public yeah. health or anything like that. <laughs> and about halfway, th and I didn't know what job I wanted when I started at university. About halfway through, I kind of just decided I wanted to do something that was about I wanted to do a public service. Um, I wanted to do something that had was, it was wasn't all about sitting behind a desk, mm. although now I to pretty much sit behind a desk. <laughs> <laughs> but at the start, it wasn't. Uh, one, I did one of the such things. Now, really, it sounds a bit cliché, and I don't mean it to be, but I wanted to do something that was about um, helping people, supporting people, mm. uh, and my personality, I guess, is one where something yeah. very structured and so on. You know, uh, the hierarchical nature of the police yeah. appealed to me. So I did some research on the police while I was at college. Uh, when they spend, spend a week and with, a, with, with, uh, with a police force going around and seeing what they did. Uh, and that really nailed it for me. It was the only job I applied for when I left university. I was lucky enough to get into the Met. I live in London, I'm a Londoner, so I kind of always going to go anywhere else. Uh, and, um, and I've stuck with it ever since, and I'd, I'd do it all again. Brilliant. Okay. So, Mr. AC Mark, um, the figures released in February showed the number of deaths as a result of knife crime in England and Wales. Last year was 285, the highest since record began on 1946. Mm -hmm. So why the, has the amount of knife crime gone up? Gosh, so this is, um, so I said just now, this is our number one kind of priority for us, is the whole uh, issue of violence amongst uh, particularly young people, not prescription particularly young people. I don't think we know absolutely the answer to that. We've got some things we think are part of it, but there's no one answer to it that I could give you and say, I'm not sure, sure it's right. <coughs> so I think um, um, there's something about what's going on in wider society. There's nothing directly about police and law and so on, um, about uh, opportunities, particularly for young people. Um, there's something about that and what that does to, you know, to some young people in terms of their perception of what, what's on offer. Um, there's something about, over the last few years, the reduction in the whole range of services that support young people. I'm not just talking about the police here, I'm talking about what things in education, youth services, youth provision, family support, all those sort of things. There's something about that, and that that's, that's reduced over the recent years. That's not a political comment, that's just a statement of what I see as a professional. Um, there's... there's um, um, there's something about the way in which we have, as a society, we've kind of made violence more prominent over time, I think, in the public eye, so the social media yeah. stuff, mm -hmm. some of the some of the kind of um, cultural stuff, we talk about things like drill music, that sort of stuff, but I think this helps to kind of create an atmosphere of, you know, I don't know, where, where, where violence is seen as something that's more, um, I don't know, it was okay. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, there's a whole range of things. There's lots of talk at the moment in the research about things like, the phrase used is adverse childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. So do we understand better now the things that happen to young people, very young age, and how that affects their um, engagement in society, their kind of, you know, I don't know, relationships, all that, so their responses to things later on. So particularly things like people who come from abusive homes as a child, what that does and later on. There's lots of different factors mm -hmm. that come into play. Could I put my finger on one definite answer? No, I can't. Uh, the drugs market has changed. We know that's a driver. So um, cocaine in particular has become much more available. Uh, there's a lots of competition between gangs to deal cocaine, for example, and other drugs. That leads to competition for territory. And that leads to some of the things we see, you know, we see as a result of that. So lots, lots of different factors. I, I couldn't, I'd love to be able to say we know the answer, but there's, there's lots of things we think come into play. And that's why part of the um, challenge for us is there's a lot of focus on the enforcement role the police have, and that's important, I think. And it's you know it takes us so far in trying to suppress violence, but that's all the police can really do is suppress it. The actual causes, the underlying stuff, is a much broader range of things that need to happen. I think, particularly for young people, um, to change the um, to change the picture longer term uh, in a more sustainable way. Look at the list. Okay. <coughs> Yeah, the so question number seven is, uh, in contrast, have the overall levels of violence in fact been found? So it's really difficult to tell because, um, firstly, we know that there's an awful lot of crime that's not, that's not reported. So a particular, a particular example of that is violence that takes place in the home, domestic violence. Um, 
The reporting of domestic violence has increased, but we know there's a vast amount of, 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 of the violence and abuse that happens within a relationship, within a home, yeah. that never gets reported to us. So if you don't tell what the actual level of violence um, in that respect is, virtually virtually impossible. Um, we know that there are lots of um, lots of people, particularly young people, who don't want to come to the police, even if they're victims of violence. So we know there's an element there that's, ne that's not going to be reported. So it is really difficult to tell. In terms of what's recorded, you then get a whole bureaucratic thing about every few years, the, the definitions of things we have to record change. So you're not comparing like with like over time. So overall, do I think we are more violent? I don't, I think... Uh, I think there's always been a level of violent society that we've, um, we've never really known. If you go back to the, um, I don't know, the 1950s, there was lots of worry about mobs and rockers and gangs then, different type of gangs yeah. than we have now. Okay. We're in the violence. You go back to the 70s, there was all the violence associated with um, football matches, football hooliganism. Mm -hmm. That's reduced, or there's still other problems with, um, with, 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 um, with football, of course, not least, kind of racism um, piece. Mm -hmm. So there have been different elements at different times. So I don't, I don't think we could really know the answer to that. What we can say is there are some types of violence that definitely increase now. Homicide is, is, is the one we can most clearly focus on um, because you know, we, we know about all the homicides yeah. pretty much. It's Stabbings, you can tell because most people say, do they don't come to us, we'll go to hospital. So you can count the hospital admissions. So we can see some of the changes and patterns there. Some of the underlying things are much more difficult to, to, to assess. Um, we feel there is no winner between the victim or the offender when it comes to knife crime. Um, would you be eager to work with us to create a campaign on this topic? Um, sure. We just want everyone to know, um, or whoever we work with, to be clear that the message is no one will ever win when it comes to knife crime. So, um, so now answer a bit about would I be prepared to work in a campaign? Absolutely. We think it's really important that, 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 that you know there are lots of messages for people to try and um, try and affect whether they get involved in carrying a knife and wherever that leaves them. Um, I also know that a lot of the messages are most effective when they don't necessarily come from a police officer, but when they come from people in the community or people yeah. that kind of, you know, that, 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 that's very different. Yeah. Um, and there are no winners, no. Yeah. no. Of course, I mean, of course, the worst tragedy is to lose your life. Yeah. And, you know, I was at an event in, um, in Brixton about three weeks ago where there were a number of families Family members, mums in particular, who have lost children to yeah. knife crime and violence. That's absolutely. the worst tragedy yeah, of all. What, that's awful. Yeah. Yes, it's a tragedy for the families where you know the person who's done the stabbing gets locked up and effectively loses a large part of their life. That's a tragedy as well. Yes. But the biggest tragedy is that is is, is the you know for the bereaved families yeah, the people that are behind. Yeah. You get the fight, and the person who is injured is the loser of that fight, yeah. and both people. You know, they're contributing to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, it's, it's um, yeah, it's it's it's, it's really hard in that respect. But no, the worst tragedy is, is yeah. you know, you meet. Uh, you may know, you may have friends, um, you know, families you know in the same way. When you meet, you meet the people who are left behind, yeah. mums and dads and so on, um, of um, particularly young people. Um, it's not just young people, particularly young people. It's yeah. just heartbreaking. Yeah. Thank you. Um, knife crime, knife crime is a particular um, big issue in the news now. Why do you think the media is um, focusing on knife crime at such a level? So I think it's because people are, are, are really worried about it and have woken up to it. Um, so um, the media, right, the media are tricky, aren't they? So you don't get many good news stories in the media. Um, the media like the drama, like is maybe the wrong word, maybe unfair, but it's good news to have a dramatic scene with lots of blue lights yeah. flashing and people yeah. very upset and distressed and to be able to talk about how horrendous something a thing is. So they, they, um, I think I think having said that, I think the media, particularly more seriously, the media are genuinely interested in it in the same way that you're asking questions about it. They want to understand what is happening, what the, the trends are, um, you know, what the things are that happen. There's a bit of, um, so I don't know, I, my view, there's a bit of voyeurism in it. So a lot of people who watch the news, you know, if you think there are some places where, the, you know, there's more of the stabbings than other places, they yeah. tend to be inner London, they tend to be the poorer communities, yeah. they're often communities, there's a large black population there, we know that's yeah. disproportionate. There are people who are, I think there's a voyeuristic element in it, it happens to other people in other places, not where I live, not my family. Yeah. And, you know, and, I don't know, that's a personal opinion on some of that. Um, 
But I also think there is a thing now, this has become such a currency in the news, in the media, in the political debate, in everything, that there is a bit about people woken up to the fact it's a real, it is, you know, the scale of the problem. It took a while for that to happen, I think. Yeah. So, you know, that kind of reason. But lots of different, again, I would say lots of different factors. The BBC reports that out of the 44 police forces across the areas, 42 recorded the rise in knife crime since 2011. Is this report is alignment in with, uh, with the use of the man police? Yeah, that does. So we've seen, we saw knife crime start to rise in London a bit before some of the other parts of the country. And now some of the other parts, some of the other cities in the country, particularly uh, you know, some, sort of like Birmingham, uh, Liverpool, Manchester, the rise is actually greater than it is in London at the moment. Yeah. So it's, they're kind of, it's not because it's just they're kind of catching up. We've also seen some of the some rise in some of the more rural parts of the country as well. Numbers are, the volume is smaller, the numbers are smaller, but still a rise. Um, so yeah, it's absolutely what we're what we're seeing. I'm trying to think which the forces that hasn't seen a rise. Mm -hmm. It's probably the city of London, I guess, because there's virtually no one lives there. Yeah. But um, um, you know, that's just a square mile in the, yeah. in the middle. But so, um, yeah, that's absolutely our experience. Um, there's some of it's connected with the thing that again there's been lots about in the media about called county lines drug dealing. Mm -hmm. So gangs in London dealing drugs that are running them out into you know okay. places that are outside London, and sometimes that leads to the violence happening in you know the place that they're trying to sell the drugs in because they're trying to compete for the market there. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a bit of that, um, but broadly, you know, yes, absolutely, that's, that's the experience. Okay. Mr. Commissioner. Is there a link between a fall in police numbers and the rise of violent crime? And can we keep people, for instance, safe in the streets on the cheap? Wow. Um, so is there, is there a link? So I think there's a link between the fall in police numbers. But as I said before, in answer to the question about what causes violent crime, I don't think you can say it's as simple as it's just because there's fewer police. Mm -hmm. As I said, really, the police will suppress violence but we can't stop, we can't deal with the underlying problems. Mm. There's a phrase we use that you can't, you can't arrest your way out of the problem. Mm. You know, arresting more people might yeah. stop some things happening tonight, mm. but it doesn't solve the long-term the long -term problem. Uh, and there is no answer in the cheap, I don't think. No, I think I talked earlier on about the investment. When I was um, um, in, about, well, in the 2000s, I worked as uh, chief superintendent in a part of East London. Mm -hmm. um, when I looked at the resource, I guess there were more police officers I had available to me in that borough, but there were also more youth workers. Mm -hmm. There were more youth projects, sort of things, you know, young people go to school, there was more support for young people with the family needing yeah. support, that sort of thing. Yeah. It's all that stuff I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. None of that is cheap. Uh, okay. None of that is cheap. Um, so, no, like, I don't think it's a, but this is a long haul. Um, this is going to take time, it's going to take a lot of effort right across the, right across the public sector. It's going to take community engagement. Communities have the biggest issue. Yeah. Sure. When communities really turn yes. against violence. The use of stop and search by police officers has deeply declined. Mm -hmm. And has this had any impact on knife crime? Um, again, it's very difficult to be scientific about it, but it is noticeable that um, if you look at the rise in knife crime, the graphs are going that way. At the same time, the graph on stop and search goes the other way. So we think we think it is. Um, it's not as simple as therefore if you do more. So we've increased the amount of stop and search quite a lot over the last year, mm -hmm. um, by about three quarters, um, more, seventy-two um, percent more. So it's a lot more. Um, it's again, it's not the only solution, uh, and there's lots of challenges with stop and search. We know that's deeply contentious in the history of, of stop and search. So it's not a straightforward thing. We have to work hard at the kind of way in which we do stop and search mm -hmm. and the engagement around exactly. it. Um, the use of body-worn cameras um, is a big important piece for that, so yeah, every yes. encounter is recorded, there's Definitely. the accountability that goes with that mm -hmm. and the transparency that goes with that. So it's an, we think it's an important tactic, an important tool for us. Um, we have had, um, we've had a reduction of about 16% in the young people under 25 years old being stabbed in the last year. We think that's a step in the right direction, it's not the problem solved by any stretch. Mm -hmm. Um, we, at the same time, we've increased stop and search, as I say, by a bit over seventy percent. Mm. So we think there is a link, just in the way we saw violence increasing yeah. came down. But it's not by no means the only answer. Um, but it's an important tool from, from the police point of view. Um, can the pair of gangs and crime meet young people to carry a man 
um, perhaps because they believe it will keep them safe? Oh yes, absolutely. I, I, I believe so. And I think there's been research in some parts of London you know, with young people that says yeah. you know, one of the reasons they kept people carrying knife because they feel threatened, they feel they'll be safer. Yeah. Yeah. The sad thing with that is, it comes to some of the messages you've got yeah. sad thing is if you carry a knife actually you end up being more likely to get involved in a fight yeah. where yeah. there's a knife exactly. use where you get stabbed. Mm -hmm. exactly. But I know, I, 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 I absolutely recognise that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Is there any advice you can give us today on how we have conducted this interview? I think it's so. No, I think it's been. Um, I think you've asked some really interesting questions. I think you've been a bit nice to me. <laughs> so I'm used to going to places. You know, you, only, you challenge me around. You know, people that you know, your question around. You know, they don't think anything will happen. There's lots of stuff that's really contentious. So stop and search is a really contentious thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yes, all well, the things I said just now, I believe. But we also know it's very unpopular in yeah. some people, and there's times when it goes wrong and, and has an adverse effect. You could, mm -hmm. you know, normally I get a bit more challenged to the other side of that coin. Mm -hmm. uh, you could have challenged me a bit more about some of the things that, you know, I would, I'm not saying I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I'm pleased you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you could, have, you, could have, you could have challenged me a bit more. So yeah. you were quite nice to me, actually. Yeah. So I don't know if you're just very polite or uh, whatever. Yeah, I believe so. I, I believe the police should be accountable. Yes. I think we, should, and we are accountable formally through the courts, through yeah. Parliament, through yeah. all those sort of things. I think we should be accountable to communities, to the people that are receiving any service we provide. So in most places I go, I'm used to getting asked fairly, you know, tough Hi. questions. I'm hoping we've run out of time now, so you can't do that. But, yeah. but that's, um, that's so, so, so I, okay. I would have expected that, so um, okay. I'm very happy to answer a lot. So, so Mark, I believe they've been very polite because they want, well, they do want to work with you in the near future. So it's very strategic thinking. And um, I think if we could all, um, if, if all the FSB students could kindly put their hands together to Mark for his wonderful work and time today. That'd be really, really great. Okay, thank you. All of you, thank Assistant Commissioner Mark for the time you spent with us because he is, of course, as we know, a very busy person higher education bit. That's part of higher education, that you learn that the problems you face, whether the business problems, health and social care problems and so on, police problems, they never be often a simple answer. It's a complex situation. Well, we've had an amazing uh, discussion today with AC Mark Simmons on the causes and the issues and the prices of knife crime. And uh, as many of you know, I've had a wonderful career, long-lasting career uh, with the police, the prisons and the probation. And if anyone wants to come and speak with me at any of our campuses, please do so. Uh, I'll be very happy to speak with you about Met Police careers and the wonderful work Mark's doing with these amazing teams. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.